It's time again for Talking Trade, sponsored by MMAC's World Trade Association and Michael Best Strategies. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Talking Trade. I am Ken Waslick, Managing Director of EM Waslick & Associates, an international business development company. And I'm Sandy Siegel, President of MEJ. I am excited today to welcome someone I've had the pleasure of knowing for many years, not only as a customer, but a friend and one of the really interesting people I've had the pleasure of meeting through international trade with a, a great story to tell. So um, welcome Steve Wallace, founder and president of the Oman Hini Cocoa Bean Company, author of Obrani and the Chocolate Factory, an unlikely story of globalization and Ghana's first gourmet chocolate bar. Um, also, you've been featured in um, George O. Pellegrini's book, Food Heroes, and in Orla Ryan's book, Chocolate Nations. So you've got a great story to tell, um, and I'm, I'm excited to share that with our listeners, Steve. So um, tell us about when you founded Omanhini Coco back in uh, 1991, and um, why Ghana, and, and how do, how did how this all get started? Well, thank you both. And it, it's true. Sandy, you and I go way back. I can't imagine importing a chocolate from Africa without Emmy Day at our side. And Ken, you and I have had a, a great pleasure of meeting over um, you know, so, so many of the venues that uh, help support trade in, in Wisconsin. So my first touch point with Ghana in West Africa, it goes back to when I was a 16-year-old foreign exchange student on the AFS program. I grew up in, in Milwaukee and wanted to get, at 16, I suppose, see the world, get as far away as possible. I won the scholarship and was placed in the town of Sunyani, Ghana. And that's where it all started, this kind of deep affection and deep in, interest in Ghana, in particular in West Africa in general. That's great. And now um, a, a, a even bigger success story or another success story, I should say, for uh, Wisconsin in particular, you've partnered with Niche Coco in Ghana and they've opened, you've opened a 44,000 square foot facility here in, in the Franklin Business Park. That is, um, it's they've gotten a lot of press lately. It's the first North American facility they've opened, and the project is the largest food and beverage investment by an African-based company in U.S. history. And um, according to the Wisconsin Economic Development Council, it's the largest kind of foreign direct investment ever here in Wisconsin. So that that's again a great inspiration for small companies looking to partner with overseas suppliers and so forth, and, and a great win for Wisconsin. So tell us a little bit about. Um, I'm sure there were some challenges and, and lessons learned in trying to make that happen. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's been just such a, a wonderful ride and, and very exciting. So my vision has always been clear going back over 30 years when I started Omanhini, was, and that's to move up the cocoa value chain. So uh, Ghana is one of the two largest growers of cocoa on the planet, along with its neighbor, the Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. They were always uh, selling beans for pennies a pound. All the value addition was really happening in Europe primarily the United States secondarily. And so my vision was clear, is there any way for these largely agricultural extractive industry countries in West Africa to move up the value chain? Uh, but overcoming history was difficult. So when I think about the challenges we had, one of them was Ghana for years, years since colonial days was thought of as sort of a pantry for Europe. It was extractive industries, whether it was gold or bauxite for aluminum or diamonds or cocoa, things would come out of the earth. They would go abroad with off takers, not customers, but just off takers, and all the value addition would happen offshore. And so what this meant was the sort of politics and the economics were very much centered on getting things cheaply from this part of the world and then making money with it elsewhere. So we were disrupting this existing value chain, and there were a lot of parties, um, both within and without Ghana, that um, had benefited from um, the old way of doing things. We had to overcome history. Uh, the other thing that I think we had to overcome is that Wisconsin was not a top of mind destination. There is not a huge di African diaspora here in Wisconsin, sort of the big Ghanaian 
diaspora communities are Maryland, Houston, Atlanta. And so everyone has a relative in those cities, in those places. And those are where everyone wants to go first because I have a brother-in-law or a sister-in-law or a cousin who could maybe help with this. So, but those are more familial reasons for location. They're not necessarily business reasons. So I had to make the case that Milwaukee, even though you may not have heard of it or be familiar with it, um, would be the perfect place for this factory, largely because of our manufacturing um, expertise, our food and beverage in particular, the food and beverage expertise in ecosystem here, and the very high, highly trained and capable labor force, and the universities, and the agricultural history of this state. So we had all these metrics that, which we were good, but you, we had to overcome the fact that people weren't familiar with the middle of the country middle of the country, everyone wants to go to New York or LA. So, and I think some of the other just things we overcame is food production in America and in Wisconsin particularly, it's highly regulated as it should be. We have some of the safest food in the world comes out of here. And um, a lot of parts of the world don't have this kind of highly regulated system. Um, so these are, you know, some of the reasons what some of the obstacles we have to overcome to realize the location of this factory here in Southeast Wisconsin in Oak Creek. Well, Steve, uh, I had the opportunity to work with uh, Ghanaians as well. And it's always, they had a relative in Baltimore or Washington or Maryland. And here we are shipping literature uh, to their relatives. And, and it's always, I'm, I'm coming to visit the relatives. So can you send me X amount? <laughs> and it's always to a residential house. But this is the way global entrepreneurs start. And as we all know, we start really small. And you know, during that journey, um, I know uh, there's a number of, of uh, economic development uh, organizations, um, both at the national level, at the state level here at WADC, uh, the select you know, various uh, countries, uh, I mean companies, both at and the municipal level. Were you able to uh, tap into some of these resources uh, during your development? Yeah, I was. And, and as a matter of fact, when you talk about these familiar relationships, you know, I met Edmund Poku, who's the managing director and sole shareholder of Niche Coco, when he was a graduate student studying at uh, Columbia University, getting an MBA in New York. So sometimes I think, you know, when we talk about what America's good at, our exports, our education system, and the fact that we let foreign students in, and many of whom, who I don't think people realize, many of them who want to go back to their home countries. They don't all want to stay here. And Edmund was a perfect example of someone who came here, said, I want to make my millions, if possible, back in Ghana. So these longstanding relationships, you take a phone call from a young student, um, directly led to the fact that we have this facility here. And we received, you know, one I should say, we didn't receive any direct financial help. And I'm always sort of, curious when people fixate on that is that's how we do business attraction. Um, because I think the real motivators are other things and it's the ecosystem. We have the food and beverage, the MMAC here, which is our chamber of commerce, our M7, which is the regional seven counties, Southeastern Wisconsin Business Association, Select USA, which is part of the commerce department that does business attraction and it helps someone like Edmund overseas figure out who to talk to in the United States. Um, WEDC, the University of Wisconsin, the Ag Department, um, all played a role in making this first and second visit of, of the Niche Coco people um, fruitful, satisfying, and um, I think enjoyable as well. So by the time they got here, there were touch points with so many acronyms in state and federal and local, I mean, inc including the office of the mayor of Oak Creek. I mean, Oak Creek was phenomenal. And um, I don't know that they had a lot of experience dealing with Ghanaians before, but the um, hospitality and the interest in seeing this project go forward was um, um, significant and real and authentic. And um, so I think Wisconsin put its best foot forward. And I should say all these players work very well together. So from my side of the table or the Ghanaian side of the table, it was just one big welcome um, from the state of Wisconsin. And you didn't realize how many players um, and how many organizations were really behind it all. That's great. 
Well, good. Well, you know, thanks for, you're a great example of a small entrepreneur, a global entrepreneur, uh, working with a country that most of us would not even think of. So do you have any last, you know, we're going to wrap it up pretty soon here uh, on this episode of Talking Trade. Do you have any good advice for budding global entrepreneurs, importers, people that are going to start your journey that you did when, what, when you were 16. Right. Well, first start when you're 16. And that's always, <laughs> and maybe pick a corner of the world that nobody's looking at at that time, and then wait for five decades and uh, see what happens. But I think some of the things that small companies are very good at, and, and, and especially in frontier markets abroad, um, don't appreciate is the value of trade craft. And that is, it's the things you do, um, both of you do, um, Ken and Sandy, is how do you get goods from one place to another? And it's not just transportation, it's customs clearance, it's classification. How do you get them in and how do you, you sell them here? And I think what people don't realize is how mature the U.S. consumer and B2B markets are. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always say that America doesn't need another chocolate bar. There's plenty, there's competition. So what an American and often a small company can do very well is figure out branding and packaging and market access and and market segmentation and people come in they say oh it's a you know a 340 million person market well it is but it's also a hundred markets some of which are only a million people deep um you know it's left-handed women who are college educated between the ages of 60 and 65 but there may be products for that demographic and i think um this is where your inventory is your brain and your creativity. And so small businesses can be maybe very skillful at accessing a specific market demographic that um, is very valuable, but people offshore are not gonna either realize it or appreciate it. And so I think these partnerships, um, there is a role to play for small companies. Sometimes it seems like it's you're in the room and it's you're the mosquito and there's a lot of um, jumbo elephants knocking about, especially in the cocoa world, we're, um, you know, very much an upstart, but, you know, we find our way. And I think that example can serve for all sorts of other sectors of the economy. Well, well, thanks for those comments. And I'm going to send you my uh, address so you can send me chocolate bars, the ones that you have, which is top of mind, top of premium, top of everything. It is amazing. Steve, it's a great story. Never get tired of hearing it. It was really, it was great to hear about how supportive Wisconsin was and welcoming and, and you know, a great shout out to everybody. Um, thank you for sharing your story today and for joining us on Talking Trade. Thank you very much. A pleasure. Good to see you both. You've been listening to Talking Trade, sponsored by MMAC's World Trade Association and Michael Best Strategies. 